Hello, my name is Megan Phelps Roper, and I am an author and the host of The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, which is an audio series that is out right now from the free press. Um, for anyone who hasn't had a chance to listen, I hope you'll go and find it wherever you listen to podcasts. But even if you haven't heard it, I think you'll still get a lot out of today's discussion. I'm joined by three very thoughtful guests. Luke Burgess is an entrepreneur and the author of the book Wanting, The Power of Mimetic Desire in Everyday Life. Tim Urban is the founder of Wait But Why and the author of the just published book, What's Our Problem? A Self-Help Book for Societies. And Nicholas Christakis is a sociologist, physician, and a professor at Yale University. And he is the author of four books, including Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Good to be here. Okay, so in our series, we use the story and experiences of J.K. Rowling as a frame or a lens to look deeply at human nature and how hard it can be to know if you are standing up for what's right or joining an unjust mob. And I think there are aspects of social media that can make this especially difficult. You know, we've had these experts saying for years that uh, social media is incentivizing extremes and amplifying our worst impulses and flattening context such that any form of dissent or disagreement often gets conflated with the most extreme positions. So we are living in this moment where people increasingly see their opponents as not just wrong, but evil. And what I started to find interesting is just how frequently people are accusing one another of engaging in a moral panic, like the witch hunts of old. So what I'd love to do today is just have a discussion with the three of you about how you understand this phenomenon and what your research and expertise has led you to think about what is happening that might not be apparent at first to a lot of people. Um, so let's start with the problem and how all of you understand it. Nicholas, I want to start with your and your wife's story from Halloween 2015. Um, there was a viral video that came from this interaction that you had in a courtyard at Yale, which to a lot of people looked like a moral panic. And it was a pivotal moment when many of us started to wonder, what is happening here? Um, for those who don't know the story, the video showed you swarmed by a group of furious students who were taunting you and insulting you and screaming at you, things like, you should not sleep at night, and you are disgusting, all over an email that was essentially defending transgressive Halloween costumes. And it just went on and on. It looked like a modern-day public shaming to a lot of people, and it looked especially out of place on an elite college campus. Your position as master, do you understand that? No, I don't agree with that. Then, then why the fuck did you accept the position? Because Who I the have fuck hired you? I have a different vision. You should step here. down. If that is what you think about being a master, you should step down. It is not about creating an intellectual space. It is not. Do you understand that? It's about creating a home here. You are not doing that. You're, You're supposed to be our advocate. That. Um... And for me, just as an onlooker, I found that situation so stressful that I could hardly stand to watch the videos. But somehow you managed to stay like very calm throughout the whole thing. And I wondered, what did you understand was happening there that helped you remain so calm while these students were essentially trying to publicly humiliate you? Well, I, I wasn't expecting that to be the opening question, uh, but you gave a fair summary of the events. Uh, you know, my principal identity is as a scientist, but I, this is part of my biography. I mean, it happened, and I recognize that it, those events became very illustrative of many events that have occurred since then. And there were prior events similar to, to the experience I had also, in fairness. I... I I would be lying if I said I wasn't proud of myself for staying calm, but I think that originated in several life experiences I've had. First of all, I'm a professor, and I see it as my job to help educate students, and the, the students, in my view, had, had lost their minds. I mean, they were not thinking clearly, and, uh, and they were acting in a way that was injurious to the fundamental tenets of a university, and in my view, injurious to their own interests and frankly, injurious to a cause that I don't disagree with, uh, you know, uh, fundamentally, which is to make our universities as broadly inclusive as possible in our society. Second, I, um, I, had, I had studied uh, scientifically pro psychological processes such as something known as de-individuation, 
when uh, when people lose their own identity and surrender it to a crowd. I mean, anyone who's been to a rock concert or a rave or just lost themselves in a I mean, I, all of us have had this experience. You're in a in a musical performance or some kind of transcendent experience with a large crowd and you surrender your individuality to the crowd uh, knows how powerful that experience can be, but also dangerous because people in that state are want to burn witches and feel righteous about it at the time that they're doing it. Uh, and so it, there's this process of de-individuation where people lose their own identity and, and surrender their own judgment to the crowd. And I, I watched it happen, like I could see it happening in front of me. And it wasn't the first time I'd seen it. it was the first time I was in the middle of it. What, what did you notice? Oh, uh, the students were being whipped into a frenzy. If you, if you look at the videos, you'll see at some point, I begin asking the students, what is your name? Hi, I'm Nicholas. And that was a very deliberate tactic to have them see themselves as individuals and have them see me as an individual. Uh, it was a tactic to, to try to lower the, 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 the stress and the tension uh, in that uh, situation. Uh, it's a similar tactic, by the way, I'm sure all of you have received hate mail in your lives. Uh, I used to, I, I can't anymore, uh, not because I'm receiving so much hate mail, but because I, uh, I get so much email. I used to respond to all mail, including hate mail. And um, you'd be amazed at how often the person who sends you this vile note immediately apologizes. You, you write and you say, oh, you know, hi, I got your note. Uh, you know, that was very aggressive of you. And I don't quite agree with this and that. And, and literally they'll write back and say, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know you would actually read the email. <laughs> you know, they were just, you know, sounding off. And, uh, and then you can, not always, but, you know, 80% of the time, let's say, you can, uh, you can mollify them and get some kind of detente. Anyway, so that's the second thing. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the first thing was the, the recognition that the, the crowd was, you know, de-individuating uh, and the, the danger that there was uh, in that situation. I was worried at some point that someone in the back would, like, throw a brick. So the other thing I was doing is I was constantly turning around and looking at everyone and making eye contact. Anyway, that was, I don't know, we could, I don't want to, I mean, those are some additional details. I don't, I'm happy to answer any other questions, but I'm also happy to just move on. Those, those events are in the past, at least for me, thank goodness. And uh, I am now in the, spending my time in the serenity and, and uh, creativity of, of my laboratory. That is wonderful. Um, Tim, it seems like a lot of your work lately, which you convey in this really artistic and analytical way, seems to be focused on the social dynamics that inspire groupthink and tribalism. And I wonder if there was something specific that inspired that. Like, what were you seeing that made you want to address it in your work? Yeah, this is a funny kind of ironic place to be right now here on this particular, in this discussion, because this is my first time ever speaking with Nicholas, but he's the one who got me involved in all of this. And, and I, I say that because that video, and, and I, know, I know Nicholas wants to move on from the video, but we're not going to let him because um, <laughs> it, was, it was that video um, in 2016 that I, I saw it um, that is, is what said, I, I, I had something had been nagging at me for a while, like something's off with our kind of, with the, the kind of political culture in the U.S. Right, like I grew up and, you know, the Democrats hated the Republicans and vice versa. And something different was going on, right? It was something as a writer, I, I have, a, you know, I'm sensitive towards this because I have, I write something and then a lot commenters, right? And I tweet something and commenters. So I'm kind of interacting with, um, with the kind of whatever the cultural vibe is all the time. And I had noticed something was different, but it, what, what made me say, okay, I, this is not just a hunch. Something's up. I need to write about this was that video. I watched the video um, and I think that, you know, I remember, yeah. And I also was impressed by, uh, Nicholas's calmness. I, um, and, and, but you know, that's what, what he was, ex what actually, what he was exemplifying there was leadership, grown up leadership in the face of kind of what was childish madness. And what I didn't quite know at the time was that the, the, I think a huge part of the problem is how many grown ups have not acted that way. And they, 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 what they've done instead is not 
not to get angry at the kids in that situation, that they've done the opposite. And they said, you're exactly right, you know, to, to, to the kids. And, and they've said, and, 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 and maybe they've even encouraged this behavior, which is to me like a total failure of leadership. Um, but, but anyway, I remember watching it and one line stuck out at me and it was um, a girl said, you know, something like, you know, because Nicholas was saying, you know, we, we should have a diversity of viewpoints and this is, you know, an intellectual space. And, you know, she screamed something back like, it is not an intellectual space. This is supposed to be a safe space, a home. So I said, so, so, so that, you know, now it seems like, of course, safe space. We've heard all these things. But in 2016, I hadn't heard this very much. And I'm thinking, so this idea that, that Nicholas's wife writes this very reasonable email, whether you agree or disagree with it, it was, it was, it was an opinion, you know, not, not personally attacking anyone. It was a gently worded opinion. The fact that that was, was, was in conflict with this being a safe place to be was like, what is going on at Yale? Right. And so this is what got me into all this. And I now started writing this and I just finished six years later. I mean, it's, it's crazy how long, because this topic Man, there was a lot. I did, you start going into it, and you don't realize how much there is to unpack here, and what is really going on. There's there's history, um, you know. There's po- the last thirty or forty years of political history in the U.S., but there's also psychology. This idea that Nicholas mentioned about um, about kind of uh, this this hive switch, you know, that that can turn on, that can turn people into um, into into you know people who are not. Uh, uh, don't have their normal heads about them and maybe might, might do something really bad. This is also, of course, the switch that is, explains a lot of the worst events in human history. Um, and, and, um, and so, you know, I started like digging Inquis- in myself. Like the Inquisition. <laughs> yeah, I mean. And, and pogroms and, you know, like you just go on down the list. Yeah, lynchings, witch burnings. I mean, yes, that's what I mean, legitimately. And it's in that situation. It's, I don't think that, I think a lot of people are, are in it. Their heads are in it. And they're kind of, they almost like, it's like they, they, they convert into something different, right? But, they, but there's a lot of other people there who I think are not actually caught up in it, but they're pretending to be because they don't want to be next in line, right? That's a, it, it, what it does is if it doesn't trigger you to be in that mode, like hardcore tribal, feeling disgust for other people, that's this very specific emotion, disgust, right? It's, it's, a, it's a universal emotion and it actually makes, it, there's a lot of studies about disgust. It, 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 it makes people... Um, it makes it a lot easier to dehumanize you, you, others when you feel dis- not just hatred, but disgust. Uh, this is why that, you know, the Nazis used rats and, and vermin as, as, as uh, to try to associate those with the Jews and the, 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 the Hutu militia would use cockroaches, right? It, for, for the, for the Tutsi. Um, so, 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 so disgust, but, but again, so that, that's one group, but I think there's a whole other group where when that's going on, it's really, really human nature to say, I want to just please these people right now. I want to seem like one of them. It doesn't make you a weak or bad person. It is human to just say in that moment, I'm going to join on and I want to be, you know, you know on this team and, and, and I'm going to show that by being extra, being just as angry and hateful of this person as they are because I'm scared. And it feels good to be part of the, the powerful group and it feels really, feel really bad to be in their sights. So in that moment, I mean, this goes back to like middle school, right? You know, it, it's it, when, when there's a mean bully kid who's also the popular kid, um, there's an instinct a lot of us have to, be, you know, jump on board with them and, 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 you know, talk shit with them about the, the, the kid that they're bullying, right? And that's, it's not admirable, right? We'd, we'd much rather say that we were the person in that moment who said, who st- stood up for the, for the kid that was getting bullied and stood up to bullies. And, um, and, but in, for middle schoolers, it's hard. And for college students, it might be hard. The thing that's so unimpressive to me is why, are, why, are more, why have more grownups not acted like Nicholas in that moment and said, let's be, let's be grownups here, but actually have had the middle school instinct to kind of jump on board as well. So um, that's what got me into it. And man, there was just a lot to talk about. This is, it's fascinating and a little scary. It's like you read about times, you read about McCarthyism, you read about, you know, um, the, the Maoist revolutions, you read all these things and it's just, you know, maybe, we're, maybe it's not quite that, but something's happening in our society where people are going to look back in 30 or 40 years and say, that was the, they'll have some term like red scare for right now, I believe. And we're, we're living in it. Mm-hmm. This is where I want to bring in Luke because, um, Luke, you talk a lot about this concept of mimetic desire as being kind of central to social conflict. Can you explain that concept and 
what role you think it might be playing in the dynamics that we're seeing play out? Yeah, a lot of my work in thinking the last few years has been inspired by the French social theorist René Girard. And he talks about a mimetic mechanism in our society, meaning people are imitating other people um, sort of in a knee-jerk way without necessarily going through the work of thinking about what it is that they're doing. And what happens is that social processes can become detached in a way from whatever the original thing was, and they can grow into a monster phenomenon of their own with a disproportionate reaction, right? And I myself, and I I know what this is like because I myself have been caught up in those processes before, and I wasn't as calm as Nicholas was, right? So I know what it feels like to be dispossessed of myself, right? To lose my self-possession. A stupid example, and more than once, right? In my high school, somebody defaced something on our football team and TP'd us, and nobody knew who it was, And somebody suspected it was somebody within the school, a rival group, or somebody that didn't like the jocks or something like that. And this literally almost like turned our entire high school into absolute chaos, right? We were projecting things. We were, I mean, the mythologies that sprung up from that. I myself was involved in it. I was super heated, right? And it it just spiraled into chaos. Turns out it was, uh, well, we never actually found out. We suspected it was somebody on the outside, but I I found myself caught up in a process that made me sort of lose my self-possession and my agency. And at a certain point, when I looked back on it, I saw, wow, that's really scary. And it wasn't the last time. So the social process often, like I said, becomes detached from whatever the offense was, real or imagined, okay? So Rene Girard would say that witch trials are one manifestation of a broader phenomenon called the scapegoat mechanism, which has really been a, a fairly constant thing throughout human history. Okay, the ancient Greeks had something called the pharmakos. They would typically push somebody off the edge of a cliff. Um, the, there's obviously ancient stonings where the guilt or innocence of the person actually is secondary, right? Because the social process itself has some social value in the form of catharsis or cohesion. So when there's a social crisis, people are singled out, right? In this mimetic way. It's almost like holding a magnifying glass over a single blade of grass. Gets everybody to focus on one thing and actually prevents people from tearing each other apart. They're, They're somehow aligned and focused on someone or something that takes on some value that is disproportionate, right? Like they're usually ascribed supernatural powers. Um, This is where the idea of a witch comes in. Um, There, we project all kinds of our our biggest fears and anxieties onto these people. And that's a scary thing when that's happening, right? Like knowing that we ourselves can be caught up in that. And one of the the things that's very convicting to me, uh, Gerard says that nobody, everybody believes that they have legitimate enemies Nobody ever thinks of their enemies as illegitimate, right? We become very convinced of that. And uh, that's convicted me because I've looked at, back at my life and seen when I was convinced that I had legitimate enemies, like my little high school story in West Michigan. And when I look back, I realize I was totally out of my mind, right? like how, how, how serious I was about that, how convicted I was that somebody was evil. And I sort of divided the entire thing into, into good kids and bad kids and stuff like that. So... Coming, coming back to ourselves and realizing that we can all get caught up in a social process that causes us to lose sight of truth is important. And seeing ourselves, I think that everybody has scapegoated somebody at some point in their lives. And it takes some humility to realize that. But if we can maybe remember what it's like to be caught up in that and what, it, you know, what we think now that we look back at it, Maybe we can gain some some critical distance and sort of see how easy it is, right? And then when we see ourselves doing that, we might remember a little bit what it feels like when we feel that that tug, you know. And we don't want to we don't want to get uh, go somewhere that we won't understand how we got there, and we can take steps to put the brakes on. Because the longer we wait, the harder it is to put the brakes on. Because most people that stand outside of a crowd are the next ones to be scapegoated, and that's why it's scary. You don't want to. Be, you don't want, when there's a crowd, when you're in the middle of a crowd, the last thing you want to do is bring attention to yourself because it's more likely for a crowd to turn against you next. I mean, this is one of the things you mentioned that I think is important as well as the, the, the standing outside the crowd. There are always actors in these events 
they're, they're, they're the true believers. There are those that are swept away. You know, uh, there are people with venal interests who like think, oh, I can, you know, m- make some money here or I can, you know, do away like Ann Applebaum routes about how many of the people denounced during during, uh, you know, the Soviet times were you would denounce the person whose land and wife you wanted. Right. Then they go to the gulag. And then when the guys came back from the gulag, they would find their enemy living in their house with their former wife, you know. So there are people that have those kinds of interests, but there are also people who know better and should do something, and I think actually often can do something. So with some of these crazy eruptions at publishing houses where the young staff say, you can't publish this book, what the publisher and editors, senior editors need to do is sit them down and say, this this idea that you have that we're to not publish books ultimately leads to an awful place. You know, we, we're in the business of publishing books. We, you know, we can exercise editorial discretion, but we cannot, you know, have a group of people who say they're offended mean that we're not going to publish some book. Uh, so, or in the, in the situation I faced at Yale, there were actually four administrators in the crowd. Four deans of Yale were in the crowd on film and did nothing. And in the events at the Stanford Law School this past week or two weeks ago, whatever it was, there were also four administrators in the crowd, one of whom got up and actually, you know, was uh, really not effective at restoring order and in, in, uh, implementing the rules and three others who said nothing. So there are people you see who I think should know better or who are entrusted with protecting certain values or certain institutions when faced with an obligation to fulfill their duty collapse. And by the way, we're not talking about Pol Pot here, right? I mean, we're not talking about you lose your life if you do your duty. <laughs> we're, 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 we're not in that situation. We're in the United States of America. You can actually actually take a stand and not fear uh, losing your life. So I don't understand why we don't see a bit more bravery by, as Tim said, sometimes the adults in the room. Let me say one more thing. It is appropriate for us to be more tolerant. The younger the actors are, the more tolerant we should be. So middle schoolers are not high schoolers, are not college students, are not law students, are not employees at major firms. These are different categories of people. But 18 to 22-year-old college students, it is the job of the faculty to help educate them, but they are adults, right? I mean, they can be held responsible for bad actions. You know, if they plagiarize something, we punish them for plagiarism, right? I mean, we have sanctions for plagiarism. And if it is a core tenet of the institution that we support free expression in our institution and we tolerate dissent, you cannot act in a way that silences people on a university campus or, or try to you know, engage in a kind of mob-like ostracism that is not in keeping with core tenets. And, and you should know better if you're 20 years old and you're at st- if you're a 25-year-old law student at Stanford or a 20-year-old undergraduate at Yale, you, you know better than to engage in these actions. And you're, you're yielding to temptations uh, that you should not yield to. Um, you know, and but I think you- we can hold them, to, hold them responsible as well. I'm not talking punitively. I'm not saying they should you know, be expelled because they you know, yelled at a, a visiting speaker. But you know, it's, not, it's also not a trivial um, violation. Do you think that the adults in the room, as you put it, like, is it because that they... That was Tim's think, expression, I think. Sure, yes. Yeah. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> um, do you think they've become convinced, though, uh, the, of the kind of positions that the younger people are taking? Is that part of the, the picture here, do you think? Or, I, I think or there's some it? true believers, but as Luke was saying, I think, I think more often than not, it's either fear or... or um, you know, I just don't want to get involved kind of attitude, um, which, you know, which ultimately leads to a kind of social, um, you know, disintegration. I think we all have a duty to preserve the common wheel. Uh, and, and, you know, not for every matter, but it's like, for example, a, a non-corrupt judiciary and paying taxes and, you know, and free and open elections. And, you know, these are basic principles, you know, free association, free expression. These are basic principles of a free society. And I think we all have some duty to do something to, you know, help preserve those, uh, those tenants. There, there's some basic, like, 
there, there, it's, I think Megan, your question is important because it's like, um, as I said, I think there's two groups with, with the, with this failure of leadership. And I do think one of them is, is, has been tricked, frankly, like, um, there's, um, there, there's, you know, very kind of basic Trojan horse terms, um, like inclusion, you know, you could say, you know, we want to be inclusive, therefore we can't allow any of these viewpoints on campus, which of course is the opposite of inclusive, right? We want to have diversity. So therefore we have to all have the same core beliefs, which is the opposite of diversity, right? There's a, there's a lot of these, when you look at them, you're like, this is, this is makes no sense, but a lot of people just, I don't think are thinking that hard about it. And they hear things like diversity, inclusion, safe space. Well, we want that. And they're kind of falling for the, the, the kind of cheap Trojan horse that I think is being used in a lot of these cases. And, you know, if you, if you look at American history, there's a lot of people who were pro segregation and that's shameful now, right? The people are ashamed if their grandparents were pro segregation or whatever in the fifties and sixties and, or, you know, the people more recently who were, you know, anti-gay marriage and, uh, in a way that I don't think many people would be proud of that stance today, at least, at least way fewer people. And so no one wants to be the old, out-of-touch person on the wrong side of history. And I think you see, you know, young people are saying this is what, you know, social justice uh, is. And therefore, I don't want to be on the old person fighting against that because in history that hasn't looked so good. So I think some people are falling for that. But I think a lot of people are not. And I think that um, it's so much easier if you're the dean. Why would you want to become another Nicholas right now in that thing? Why would you want to stand up? And now there's two of you getting yelled at. And now you might have to. He left the school. Like you might have to leave the school. Maybe your family is there. Maybe your kids are in school there, and you're you, you need that paycheck. So it's just not worth it. But like when you talk about this uh, publishing house, and the same thing you can say at Google, the same thing you can say about you know Yale and Harvard or the American Medical Association uh, or the ACLU, one after the other, what you're seeing is. This this pattern, which is that these institutions, they're founded on, you know, they have a telos, right? The telos is of the knife is to cut, right? It's the, the core purpose. So the telos at Harvard or Yale is supposed to be veritas, right? Truth. And you get to truth with all kinds of, you know, the clash of different ideas and academic freedom and openness. That's how you find truth. So what you're seeing there is there's a mob or there's an ideology or a group that, that says, this comes in, comes in and says, our sacred tenet conflicts with yours. So you, you say, you know, veritas and we need diversity of viewpoint. We're saying the opposite. We want something different here. We want this to be kind of a, a, sanct, you know, a sanctuary uh, for a certain set of ideas. So that's direct conflict. Now, of course, there's always people within institutions that want to hijack the institution and supplant the telos with their own, you know, agenda. And normally they can't do that, right? Because the institution stands up for itself. So what you're seeing is a kind of a, 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 a that there's a uh, there's kind of a, a power struggle going on between one group that says we're changing the telos here and another group that's supposed to be saying no you're not this is what we do here sorry which is you know again what what why Nicholas ended up uh, with a million views on YouTube is because he stood there and kept saying that's not what we do here we are a veritas place and. That power struggle, in this case, how did it end? He had to leave. The, the culture, the, the, the mob kind of got their way. And, and so what you're seeing is, I think, with publishing houses, you know, when, when the publishing house, when the editor-in-chief is saying, we publish all kinds of ideas, and the 25-year-old employees are saying, this is dangerous to publish this, and we're going to ask you to resign, and we're going to start a huge Twitter mob and a petition. To That's a moment of truth for, for that publishing house. And the question is, you know, in that moment, the, the, I think this whole thing partially can be explained by the, those moments one after the other have gone the wrong direction. And it's almost contagious. You know, you see other companies folding to this thing, so you do it too. Other companies are doing the big apology on their website, so maybe we should too. And it's a little bit like Luke was talking about, kind of copying each other's cowardice. Well, it's also, I mean, just the thing, what people don't understand is apropos of the publishing house example, I mean, there's so many directions we could go is... You have the far right and the far left calling for books to, to you know, not be sold, not be in libraries. I can understand debates about in elementary school and, and high school even about what books should be, let's say, on the curriculum. I would, of course, be widely tolerant of almost any book on the curriculum. But there are people who remove books from libraries unapologetically. I mean, you can find videos of, you know, uh, because the parents have complained, the books are being carted out of the library or prohibited. It's not just that we don't put them in the curriculum. We won't stock, you know, the bluest eye 
or uh, you know, these are crazy. Or or J.K. Rowling's books. There are far people on the right that think you know it it, it encourages witchcraft or something. I mean, these are they, they they don't see the history that they are aligning themselves with book burners, you know, for <laughs> which never ends well, you know. And so, so I just I you know the publishing house example really struck me, and there are, of course many many other examples that you know you you you. Our telos is we publish books that people can choose to buy, uh, and we are committed to the widest possible exchange of ideas in our society. There's, there's, there's a paradox there that, I mean, so originally and for a long time, a lot of people saw the internet as a tool for expanding our horizons and where everybody could have a voice and a much wider range of perspectives could be heard. But it seems like more recently and practically, like there is even more social pressure to conform and I, I just wonder how you all think about that. Is it just because we are so much more aware of what other people are thinking all the time? It's kind of like a, a, a just a distorting effect of like funhouse mirrors a little bit, like trying to see what other people think and like posturing in some way. Or, or what, what do you make of that of that paradox? I think a lot of it has to do with social media. Like the, the another book example, the American Booksellers Association. You know, they their whole thing on their website at least used to be, I think they've changed it a little bit. It was uh, like something, they don't burn books, basically. It was like their motto, something along those lines. And they had like, they have literally, they have banned books week where they, 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 they celebrate the, the unbanning of formerly banned books. And they, they have this whole, you know, self, you know, this righteous thing about all of this. Then they put out their, you know, their box of books to, to small bookstores. A couple, I think, I think it was 2020. 2021. And one of the books in there was Abigail Schreier's, uh, um, irreversible damage. Yes. Irreversible damage. Um, um, which was, you know, one of the London times, best books of the year, one of the Economist's best books of the year. And this was not a bigoted book. This was a concerned mom who, you know, again, agree or disagree with her. She was making, you know, valid points that at least should be, uh, you know, fought with evidence and whatever. So you they don't put agree out, they put with her? You don't agree with her? Write another book. <laughs> right. You know? Write another book. And, 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 or don't buy the book or whatever. You know, write another book. Don't buy the book. Those are great options. So instead what happened was they put, they put the book out, right, which tells me they didn't – they you know, but their philosophy, they said this book is fine. Again, with, under their current telos of who they are, this makes sense to include as, amongst all the other books because it's a popular book and it's, it's getting good ratings and all of that. Uh, and what happened is Twitter explosion – uh, some bookstores, you know, owners went on there and said, this is dangerous. Again, it's, it's, it's important, the framing. It's not saying this, this offends me. Because then, you know, it'd say, well, in America, live and let live. If it offends you, go to, but in America, will harm, you know, that's the one time you can, you know, self-defend, you harm. So, um, so they, it was saying this is dangerous and this is, this is going to, this is violence against trans people. Not it's going to cause violence. This is violence against trans people. So again, you imagine the moment of truth at the ABA, and they're saying, "Ah, oh, well, we, we, you know, this isn't us to 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 sit, to go back on this." But these people, and what happened? They send the effusive apology, saying this we should should never have happened. We've caused irreparable harm and damage. And so, to me, I just saw the story there. Social media was the trigger that completely flipped that story. That's what the, in the power struggle. That's what flipped it to the other side in this that story. Yeah. I, oddly, I mean, there's been a break dog, breakdown in dialogue in our society. And it, it, what's strange to me is that there doesn't seem to be any virtue or nobility in dialoguing with people that you disagree with, right? I mean, we even have derogatory names to refer to people that try. It's called, you know, both sidesism or platforming somebody or, you know, you're being too kind, you're giving them too much credit. Spineless it's, centrist. It's strange. That, yeah. And one of the studies that shocked me, um, I forget wh who, who put this out, but it was something like, in the 60s, if you ask parents if they would be okay with their child marrying somebody of the opposite political party, something like 60% said they'd be okay with it. I mean, this is somebody who loves your child, you know, your child's in love with. And I think today it's well under 10%. I mean, I think it's like 5% or something like that. That is really telling. I mean, it's almost like there's not even, even love itself right, can't compensate. Right, it can't can't allow us to be in dialogue and live with these people. So there's something very strange happening. And social media has had the opposite effect that I think many of us thought it would have, where people are siloing into tribes, and people are not even rewarded. I guess is the point I'm trying to make for trying to have a conversation. They're viewed as weak. 
Now they're viewed as making concessions that they shouldn't make, not sufficiently demonizing people. And that to me is really scary. Some people are outraged by the idea that we should draw like any sort of comparison between what happened to Nicholas at Yale or, you know, someone losing their job for a bad tweet. Like they're outraged by the idea of comparing those things to burning someone at the stake. And of course, they have a point. Obviously, it is a very good thing that we don't round up our witches and torture and kill them. But I wonder, what would the three of you say to the skeptics? Um, like, even though these modern punishments are really nowhere near as bad, why should we be careful with threats of public shaming and social ostracism? Like, what are the costs to us as a society when those threats are pretty freely wielded against others? I mean, I would say I would say three things in response to that. First of all, um, the, when people compare some of these events to Maoism or witch burning, they don't mean literally it's a cultural revolution. But the underlying principles, as Luke has been and Tim have been emphasizing, are the same underlying principles. They're ma not manifested in quite the same efflorescent way, but they are the same, this tribalism, this scapegoating, this sort of righteous indignation, this desire to ally oneself with a cause greater than oneself and so on. These are all the same, the fear, these are all the same motivations. So people, when they make those analogies, they typically mean it's the same psychodynamics, not that it's literally the same, first point. Second, I would say that uh, it is no small thing to deprive an adult of a livelihood. I mean, to take someone's job away, or if you're like a writer or a reporter and you've been, you run out of the profession, for example, uh, that's devastating. Your whole life has been devoted to this profession. And so not only do you lose your income, but you lose a lot of your identity. These are, this is a, not a trivial sanction. Yes, we didn't burn you at the stake. <laughs> that's true. But we did something very bad to you. We made you, you know, we put a scarlet letter on you and we took away your job and your friends were afraid to associate with you. These are devastating social sanctions not to be trifled with. That's my second point. My third point is, there have been, I have spoken over the last 10 years to many people who have been the objects of these types of inquisitions, for lack of a better word. And I know of at least eight cases of people who seriously considered suicide because of the social ostracism. I know one case, a case at Dartmouth, a man I knew who took his life uh, after he was subjected to this type of insanity. And he went to the local grocery store and people would, would, you know, in order to feel better about them, and he was innocent. This, this man was innocent of the charges, completely innocent. And people would try to stay away from him at the local grocery store and marginalize him. And, and he took his life. And I've talked to, like, I don't know, as I said, nearly 10 such people, and they seriously consider suicide. So these are, it, it, is a, it, is a, it is a very disorienting thing to have your livelihood taken away, to have people uh, shun you, to uh, to be the to be the object of of a public scorn, uh, especially if you're innocent and you haven't done, actually done anything wrong, it's bewildering. So I don't think I don't think it's such a trivial matter as to say, well, you know, okay, we're not Paul Pot. That's like a pretty low bar, you know, like, of of judgment. I think it's important to to say that even if somebody is guilty of a transgression, even if they did do something wrong. The, the the social process or the scapegoat mechanism does not make every form of, of justice okay, right? So the scapegoat mechanism, a fundamental point, is that the guilt or innocence, and people can be guilty and still be a scapegoat. Most people don't realize that. You can still be a scapegoat even if you did something wrong. We typically associate it with innocent people, right? But one of the most, I, I'll never forget the graphic images of Omar Gaddafi in Libya, Right. He he was a violent man. I don't think he was a very good man, but he was literally lynched and dragged through the streets. And when he died, um, somebody made a statement that literally all evil has now been eradicated from Libya. You know, with this with this man gone, it was a quintessential example of the scapegoat mechanism in action. But nobody is saying that Gaddafi was a perfect man. The point is that there was a social mechanism at work. Um, that led to his murder, that led to his death. And it was somehow detached, right, from, it was a, it was a process, there was, you know, no due process. And this is kind of how it works. So I think it's an important distinction to make that even if you are convinced that somebody did something really wrong, right, 
the, the, the social process and violence that can occur in response to that can be disproportionate due to the effect of this mimesis, which magnifies everything. It's not linear, and it's like a snowball effect where before you know it, people can do really bad things in response to um, what could have been a, a relatively minor infraction. Yeah, I mean, these are more focused on individual consequences. And I think, Tim, I've seen a lot from you over the past several years about the effects, the knock-on effects that that has for society as a whole. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Like, what, what do you, how would you describe the cost to us for this kind of, like, leaning on public humiliation? Well, uh, the way I, I mean, look at the civilization around us, right? No one person can build that. No one person can really do much. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the incredible societies and, and technology and everything that we have is the product of this magical thing that humans can do that other animals can't, which is that we can connect our brains together like neurons in a larger brain. And that super brain is way smarter than any person and also can be, again, if, if the brains are connected in the right environment, can be wiser, can actually make very, you know, well thought out, wise decisions that, that no one person has the life experience to make. What we're, we've been talking about is something else that the same exact species can do, which is they can combine together into the totally different kind of monster that has no brain, basically, and is is kind of a, a, a war machine, you know, that that stems back 50,000 years, you know, to when that was a survival need to act like that. So we have these two capabilities, right? And one is you know the emergent property is 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 scary and not is, and and not intelligent and the other is the emergent property is wisdom and and knowledge and intelligence and so what do you need it's a fragile environment that creates the wise giant right it, it you can, it, you need to people to be that's why you know you need not just free speech laws uh, you need free speech culture and free speech culture is a place where it is it is safe to say. What you think? You know, I, 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 it, the, fun, the I, ironic thing about this is that so many of these these examples happen in progressive environments. When I, I grew up thinking that people in conservative households with rigid rules and and they 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 can't wait to get to college to escape that to go to progressive environment, which is safe to be different, to be weird, right? To to be yourself, right? That's what progressivism was to me. That's why I felt so cuddly about being a progressive, right? And to me, it's like, that's, that's, it's not at all what's happening. Like, it, you know, and, and so it's like, that's what you need. You need that feeling of it's just, this is a safe society to open up in. And so when you have this dynamic going on, this kind of, this, this, this rise of mob power, and it's not that ri- mobs are always around, but the, the mobs have more power than they normally do. The rise of mob power, what that does is most people go quiet. Most people go silent, and then a lot of other. So, like we said, a lot of people start to be convinced of bad ideas because there's not good ideas out there, convi- you know, uh, clashing with them because everyone's scared. But a lot of other people, they, they don't believe the bad ideas, but they go very quiet. And what happens is that group intelligence goes away. So you have in a healthy environment, you have a lot of people with a lot of different views, independently thinking and saying what they think. Right? When you have this new dynamic, very quickly we snap into this other mode where. People go quiet. They start to they start to repeat orthodoxy because that's 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 what their tribal brain wants to do at that moment. And uh, you end up with these huge gaps in what the marketplace of ideas. One gap is a ton of people not saying what they're thinking. Another gap is a ton of people saying what they're not, not really thinking. You you suddenly have uh, you know something that you know in, in surveys you see what people are thinking, but then you hear what people are saying. And it seems like everyone agrees with this because a lot of people are saying it because it's the way to be popular. And a lot of people want to say what's popular regardless of what they think. So that to me is so scary because, uh, we're moving into a future, uh, that has full of exploding technology and we're getting more godlike power as a species every year from all of this technology. Um, And that's a time when you need our wits about us as a society, right? We want to have that wise giant doing the thinking and trying to figure out how to proceed forward. And what you're seeing is the opposite. Because of these dynamics and and discourse melting away, what you end up with is a battle of orthodoxies and, you know, uh, uh, the, the kind of collective IQ of the society going down at what I think is like the worst time. 
Yeah, I mean that's the, the spiral of science is the spiral of silence is real. You know, when you're sitting around a dinner table and you're the only one who's like, yeah, I'm not quite sure if I really agree with what everybody else is saying, but I better not speak up because I really don't want to. I don't have the energy to have that conversation right now. And then everybody else assumes, you know, it reinforces their idea that you agree with them, and it's a spiral. And the word that Tim used that I think is so important is culture, culture of free speech. If you don't like what's going on on Twitter and some of the tribalism, I personally don't believe that there's anything that Elon or anybody at the top of Twitter can do. There's no feature that they can introduce, nothing that they can do to solve the problem because they can't create culture, right? And there's no sort of technological solution that can create that culture. So if we believe that the fabric of a pluralistic society is somehow breaking down, that is a cultural problem. Uh, just as much as it is a technological problem. And I, I'm skeptical that I don't believe, in fact, that there's any kind of top-down solution for that. We have to kind of dig deep and see what we're doing as people. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd mean, like to just, I'd like to interject ahead. and add something about culture because um, it is, in fact, our capacity for what is known as cumulative culture, which is that we can share knowledge across not just space, but also time. We make a super brain, not only with everyone else around us, but also with everyone who's ever lived, right? So, you know, Isaac Newton invents the calculus, you know, over a course of a year, 400 years ago. And, uh, and now anyone who's born can, it's their, their gift. They, they get given calculus. Or 10,000 years ago, people domesticated animals or made seeds or figured out how to smelt iron. So a human born today is the beneficiary of all this intellectual capital that has accumulated for centuries. I have a more efficient life. The, the life that I was given, that I live in 20, you know, when I was born in 1962, that I get to live, I can do more stuff in my life because when I was born, I was given all this knowledge that had taken centuries, millennia to accumulate. By the way, also knowledge, as one of the, my other colleagues said earlier, about social arrangements, right? Like people have been tinkering with like what makes for a sound society. And we should be careful before we kind of throw it away and think we're going to start from, you know, day zero and have a, you know, some kind of utopian society because we start from scratch. So, so all of this stuff, you know, like, like if a person that was born a thousand years ago over the course of a day could, I forgot, these, these, these statistics are in my book Blueprint, could, you know, farm, I don't know, a certain amount, an acre. And then a person that was born, you know, 500 years ago where there was more technology about hoes and and uh, and uh, how to you know hitch uh, draft animals to do it could farm you know five times as much and a person born in 1900 their tractors that same person can farm even more land so all of that is the beneficial impact of cumulative culture but when I was listening to Tim what I was thinking about is and, and this is a very p preliminary idea I, I don't know how how strong this idea is but. I think there's there are benefits to sharing thoughts, but there may not be benefits to sh as many benefits to sharing feelings. You know, like this super brain, when we combine knowledge and ideas, as, as Tim was saying, maybe that super brain is wiser than any one of us. But when we combine all our our emotions, that may not be the case, right? Like uh, this this uh, you know when. Uh, and, and that may actually lead us in, into a worse situation. So I don't know. There, there may be different Emotion ways. Emotion is contagious. Can... I mean, it's kind of scary. Yeah. You go on Twitter and you spend some time in the wrong thread, you know, with the wrong set of commenters. And you suddenly, I feel like a, this childish, petty anger. Um, and I'm, you know, I want to write back. And I'm thinking, this is a rando. Why, why would I let this, friend, why would yes, I ever sir. be in this no. mode? My but, friend. But, 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 and, and, it's like a my super friend Dan spreader Gilbert, event, though. Yeah. My friend Dan Gilbert, who's a psychologist, said to me once, he goes, why, if this person came up to you at a cocktail party, you would turn away and walk away from them. Right. Why on earth would you spend time with this rando saying stupid things? But you're right. There's something about the medium that's very tempting. And, you and, need not to and that person, by the way, might be acting like an asshole because they caught the virus yes. from the thread they were on, right? And, and it's like it, – it's, like, it, it's, a, it's a global super spreader event for, I think, petty emotion. And so it's like you said, this, when our emotions can kind of like connect together, maybe it's not, not so great. And not all emotions are equally contagious, and that's, that's a bit of a problem. There was a study done on Weibo, which is basically China's version of Twitter. 
and they found that anger is exponentially more contagious than something like joy, right? So you go and you tweet out something nice about your cat or your dog, that's probably not going to be as contagious as if you said something really controversial and angry, right? And that's part of the problem is that the contagion doesn't necessarily work as well for the positive things. Well, I mean, I, I would love to hear from all of you, what do you think are the best tools that we have to overcome these problems? And Luke, you talked about the power of a single anti-memetic event or act. You point out that in many cases, people would rather be wrong than alone. And But you also say that it can work in the opposite way. Can you, can you talk about that? I think we need to um, exercise our ability to have conversations with people that we disagree with. I think it was in the fifth episode of your podcast, J.K. Rowling said that she had a friend, uh, I think it was a Catholic friend that she had that had very different views from her, and that uh, completely disagree on some very serious fundamental issues, but that she's no way she's going to cut the person out of her life, and that she's grateful for the friendship, and she puts the effort into cultivating that friendship. It's a person who's very important to us. That is a very simple thing. Right? It's just one person in her life, and she values that, and she values the, di- the dialogue, and she tries to empathize with that person, and I think that that feeling is mutual. So I think that we can – it is possible to have positive mimesis, and when we see good dialogue modeled, it makes it all the easier for us to do it, and we need more leaders to step up and model that and to not be cowards right, in the face of a mob. So I thought that was, that was my favorite part of the episode. Because she was pointing to something concrete that she's doing in her life that allows her to exercise the very um, powers and things that we, we need to be able to do. I mean, what do you, how are you going to have a conversation with somebody you disagree with if you don't have anybody in your life that you're friends with or that you have to spend time around that you disagree with? So I think these anti-memetic acts are important. And I think the story you're referring to in, in my life was when somebody... Um, very unexpectedly showed mercy and kindness to me, right? Mercy is not something that is very prominent in our culture right now. I teach in a business school. I often say, when's the last time you saw mercy in a business, right? And, uh, you know, this person showed me unexpected mercy. He didn't have to. I ruined his $100,000 car. My dog dragged a table into the back of his BMW. And uh, he could have, he had every right to be angry with me. But he, well, he wasn't, right? He showed me this murder. And it, it, it actually affected, I've never forgot this. It happened 15 years ago. I've never forgot that. And I've thought, well, the next time somebody, you know, has a dog that, you know, does something to my, to my property, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check myself and remember, and remember how I respond. So I think we just need more examples of this kind of, these anti-memetic acts where you don't respond the, instinctively. You wait and you respond in a way that's gracious and is not reactive. Yeah, I just want to like jump in to say one thing quickly, and then I want to hear um, Tim and Nicholas's ideas. But just a big part of the reason that this show exists, I think it touches on things that all of you have said. So you talk about the anti-memetic act, Luke, and and Tim, like how people are self-censoring and like not saying what they really think. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of people before I started this project, before I wrote to J.K. Rowling, um, because I knew that obviously the the conversation around sex and gender specifically, but a lot of things in, in general, um, it's it, it has become incredibly toxic. And people think that just the act of having the conversation itself is somehow transgressive and encouraging bad things. Um, and the more I talk to people, the more I realized – so many people, most people I talk to don't actually believe that. And so we started, you know, doing the show in part because it's just to open that conversation, to try to create that culture that you talked about, Nicholas um, and, and Tim, because obviously something very valuable, many valuable things are lost when we are afraid to have those conversations with people we disagree with. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to hear what you, uh, Tim and Nicholas think about what are our, our best ways out of this. Well, when you have a sea of cowardice, a little bit of courage goes a long way. Like, you know, this is, I, I, I love Nicholas's point about Pol Pot. It's a really important point here because there's, there's courage and then there's courage. Like I look at, um, uh, something like standing up to a, a movement that is killing people. Um, I look at the Iranian. Like Sophie Women's Shaw, Bill- Sophie yeah. Shaw, who was put to death by the Nazis, mm-hmm. you know, the white rose of Berlin. That's mm-hmm. real courage. Yeah, <laughs> or even today, example that. like 
the the the, the, the rock climber, Iranian rock climber, who wears her hijab, or who wear, wears her open hair, um, which she's not supposed to do, and then disappears the next time. I mean, that is there's no I don't think there's any courage in the U S that is on that level, because um, that's a hard cudgel, right? The hard cudgel can actually kill you or imprison you. So we're talking about a soft cudgel. Now, um, Nicholas made another good point, which is that the soft cudgel, if you don't think too hard about it, it has the same effect, right? It feels, it, it, it feels basically as scary in that moment to be fired or socially ostracized. Um, but, the, but, the, but it's not. And it, it's this great epiphany, I think, that um, uh, you, you know, you can, uh, someone can have and say, wait a second. Everyone is scared of kind of an emperor with no clothes here and, and, and whoa. And so I can actually be, seem extremely courageous and stand up for my company and stand up for my employer, or stand up for my friend or whatever it is. And actually, it's not actually that courageous. It doesn't, I don't, I don't need to be that brave to do it. Now, some people, are, if they get fired, different, but most people are not going to lose their livelihood. The small percentage of people that would, that's different. And I'm not even, I I don't think they need to do anything necessarily. It's the vast majority of people who are scared of basically social negativity coming towards them. And they're the sacrifice they're making to avoid social negative, negative consequences of some kind. Um, they're selling the souls of their company. They're, 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 they're disrespecting themselves by, by not, you know, not, 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 having the integrity that they have in other areas of their life. Like it, it, once I think people start to realize that and get a little bit more angry and also realize that the sky is not going to fall if I speak out, I think just like Luke talked about the spiral of silence, I think you can have a positive spiral, right? You can have the spiral of courage. Um, how did McCarthy, you know, McCarthyism end? How did the Red Scare, I mean, it's at some point someone starts speaking up and then look at the, the three deans standing with Nicholas, right? If, if Nicholas is left alone, he's, he's toast. If one dean comes in, maybe they're both toast. If all four deans come in, no way. They're, they're, they're all fine. If all the grown-ups together say, wait a second. So that's what happens when one person stands up, especially if the sky doesn't fall on them, it encourages others. I, I saw one really great example recently, which was, um, uh, you know, there was this awful story about James Bennett getting fired at the New York Times. He was the head of op-eds for publishing an op-ed that basically, you know, offended New York Times employee sensibility, but it was you know, half the country agreed with it. So that, you know, a real newspaper should be publishing that. Anyway, he ends up getting fired. It was one of these terrible stories where the leadership and the moment of truth sided with the mob. Flash a couple years later, uh, very recently, Washington Post writes an article and they say, you know what, let's, it's time to say it. We were wrong about that. We should have defended James Bennett. We didn't because we were scared. I was like, okay, that is huge because they didn't have to do that right now. And it tells me that either the fear is going down a little bit or whatever's happening that, okay, how about some other newspapers start speaking up? How about, you know, and, and, uh, when, when, when James Bennett gets fired, it sends a message to all the other op-ed editors. Don't, you better not speak out. When Washington Post says that, it sends a message to op-ed editors, maybe actually this thing is over a little bit. Maybe I can. So I think if, if you, you know, if, this is one of those times when one voice can go a long way. Uh, that, you know, I think that, that, that everyone should realize that if they can express courage in a sea of cowardice, it's, it actually is a really big deal. I have the sense that you're winding us down, Megan. So I don't know with whatever time I have. Uh, I would love to hear whatever you think. I need all well, your wisdom. <laughs> I have a couple of things I wanted to say uh, that uh, trying to synthesize a little bit of some of the things I've heard, but also integrate it with, you know, some expertise I may have about some of these things. But uh, we've talked a little bit about tribalism and, it, and we've just taken it for granted that tribalism is a fundamental property of human, of humans, of our species. Uh, but there's a question, which is why? Why do we have this feeling of tribalism? And there's a deep set of ideas about the origins of tribalism, which is that it, we evolved the, this capacity for tribalism and this us versus them set of um, properties precisely because it helped us to be more cooperative as a species, which is an irony. And the, the, I can give you an example of this. Imagine you have a thousand people in a room and you go and you tell these people, be nice to everyone else. Well, that's a lot of people. You, you might be nice to someone and might never see them again. If you see them again, you might not recognize them because that's too many people. 
it, and so what happens is, is maybe you start out being nice, but then there's some jerk that's not nice to you. And so then you say, oh, well, they're probably all terrible. And then you stop being nice. And what you find in people, my lab and other labs have done experiments of this kind. What you find is, is that cooperation collapses in such a large group and that nobody is nice to anyone. And eventually there's no cooperation. Now imagine another counterfactual, which you go into the, a group with a, a thousand people and you just form them into 100, into 10 groups of 100 and you give them little colored flags, the purple flags and the green flags and the brown flags, you know. And now you just tell everybody, just be nice to the people with your color flag. This is known as adding structure to a population. You add some structure by dividing it. And then all of a sudden, you probably already are intuiting that it's much nicer because when you see someone with your color flag, just be nice to them. And, and you're likely to bump into them again. You can tell who's who. There's only 100 of them. You can track them. So, so this, this tribalism you see, this, this propensity to be nice to just your colored flag people, um, actually co-evolved, some theorists, uh, some evolutionary biologists believe, with our, our ability to be cooperative, which is a wonderful property that we have. So one of the ironies of tribalism is that it may be served this purpose. Okay. But we have a lot of tribalism in our society right now. Even if it's a normal part of human behavior, what can we do about it? Well, evolution has endowed us with two other interesting properties. One is, is it's the capacity to be unique individuals. Think about your kidneys. For your kidneys to do the job, all kidneys should function the same. All of us, our kidneys, to optimally function physiologically, they should look and be the same. But for our faces to do their job, they should all be different right? We don't all have the same face. Why is that? Not only that, but we have the capacity to recognize individual faces, which is an evolutionary luxury. We have a huge part of our brain is devoted to the ability to recognize faces and tell them apart. Well, because it is to our advantage to be unique individuals. If you don't want someone to forget that they had sex with you, or that you were nice to them, or that they are your child, right? Hi, mom, it's me, not someone else. Take care of me. You need to be able to signal your unique identity and it needs to be recognized by the other person. So we have this capacity not only for tribalism but for uniqueness, which is ironically also required for our ability to be social animals. Okay, well that background, let me then say something about tribalism because I think it's what ails us, one of the things that ails us right now in our society. And there are basically two solutions to the problem of tribalism that are grounded both in our evolutionary history and also interestingly in our history. One is to go up a level, right? To say we're all Americans, for example, to, to, to exploit our capacity to make arbitrary boundaries and, and, and dissolve the boundaries that aren't as important. And de Tocqueville writes about this, right? 200, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, writes about how you can, anyone can be an American, which is amazing about our society. You can just immigrate to our society, you buy into some basic principles, and you're an American. And so that, that ability to go up a level is hugely important and is part of our history as well. And you see this as well in tropes, like, you know, all the nations of the world are divided, and then the aliens invade, and now we have a common enemy, and so all of our divisions go away because we're all humans, Right. So up a level is one solution. We're all Americans. We have a certain fundamental commitment to certain basic principles. We can all get behind that. But another idea is to go down a level, down to the level of individuals, and say, actually, these group differences are stupid. And this is the essence of Martin Luther King's argument. I'd rather live in a world where people are judged by the content of their character as individuals rather than by the color of their skin as members of a group. Now, King is a complex thinker, said lots of things, but that's a very key idea that's also part of our, our cultural ethos in the United States. So rugged individualism, you know, your, your own person and so on. But this is crucially important. When we reduce people to simply being members of other groups, you know, this religion or rural versus poor, or black versus white or whatever, we, we efface, we, do, we take something away from them actually and we harm them in a way. But, this, but going down a level is another solution to the problem of tribalism. So I share all of your concerns about ascendant tribalism in the United States today. I do believe it's a serious problem. I think it's made worse by social media, but thankfully we've been endowed with the, with the tools to address it. 
Nicholas, Tim, Luke, thank you all so much for being here. I am so grateful for your time and for sharing your thoughts again. Um, and for, again, for anyone who hasn't listened to The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, it is out now. And a major reason it exists is to spark conversation on difficult topics. And we hope it does that for you and people in your community. So thank you all again. Thank you.